Hi, it's Susan from World Peaceful, and I'm going to have a conversation with Rupert Murdoch today. I've been listening to recordings from his Boyer series of lectures, and I felt inspired to produce a video where I'm going to actually respond to some of the things he's saying as a means of feeding back from another perspective. He stated in some of his earlier lectures that for him it was very important to create a bond with the, the reader. I listened very intently to what he was saying. As I was learning more about the perspective of what the actual reader wants, whereas I tend to take a perspective, because I'm not in the paid news media, I'm really just a person who is a communicator. I tend to communicate self-expression, which is a different form of information, if you like, because it's coming from an authentic aspect of myself. So it's communicating in a different way, whereas the newspapers would be looking at topical issues that they believe are relevant to the readers to increase circulation. So there's a business paradigm behind that as more circulation generates more profits and so on. So I thought I would not listen to this until I listen to it now, this current lecture, because I like to give an authentic view. I don't like to write notes or try and win the argument. I simply want to respond authentically, which is my way. But before I do, I thought I'd take my laptop outside. <laughs> I like taking you for a spin. Just because it was pretty outside and I just thought it might be a nice place to start. I don't know why. <laughs> so just looking, this is Australia. A little bit of where I'm at. And we have a cute dog here. Hello. Got a cute dog. <laughs> Kelpie. I sort of bring that up because listening to Rupert is always interesting because he's very he's very ocker, as we would call him in my culture, and he's had a huge impact around the world. You know, he came into the newspaper business because his father was in it, and so it's been his whole life and that's been his perspective. But anyway, um, this is just something I want to do as a matter of interest to see as an experiment really what he thinks what I think. So I hope the audio is picked up. I'll... Poverty is not pretty. Mm. Poverty is not ennobling. Poverty is neither romantic nor rustic. We all have a responsibility to create the conditions for the poor to be less poor and then to be middle class and beyond. I'm pausing him there because he talks about creating the conditions for the poor to be less poor. Depends on what he perceives as poor. I know that if he was sitting in front of me, he would say, well, obviously you don't have enough money to buy enough food, um, paying rent's difficult, there's a lot of stress. So he sees poverty as a difficult circumstance, which, of course, I mean, I've lived in poverty most of my life. It is. Um, it can be, particularly when you can't afford to pay a bill. But that idea of becoming less poor, that that's the panacea, because I've heard this argument before, economic growth is the way to solve poverty. And, of course, there'll be countries that have been lifted out of poverty they see because they've increased their materialism. And yet, I would just put to him for consideration, there is a poverty mentality in the chasing of money in that there's never enough. I sometimes would view people with a lot of money as even more poor than the poorest person. And in actual fact, if you go to places like India, which I know he's been, and uh, China, You'll find a generosity in the poorest of people and it's because they don't identify with materialism in the same way they actually value people. I would say they had real wealth rather than positioning them as victims and he has mentioned this victim mentality in one of his previous lectures, the sort of poor me type of thing. That's not the case. I found incredible generosity in the poorest of people. So that's just a, a thought. Now, I'll let him continue. 
We all have a responsibility to challenge ideas and ideologies which have incarcerated hundreds of millions in poverty for far too long. There is cause for modest celebration. One of the most... I have to pause him there again because ideas come up as he's speaking. He's talking seeing the world in a state of poverty. Well, I don't see that. I see traditional societies that were not materialistic who were living a life where need equals want. Poverty, in my opinion, came about through the generation of wealth. I don't think 50,000 years of Indigenous history, those Indigenous people would have said, I'm poor. They only had what they had. They did their art. They weaved their baskets. They, you know, they um, went and found bush tucker. They killed kangaroos for meat. They had an abundance in actual fact. So sometimes that lack of materialism can be perceived as poverty, but the, the real poverty has nothing to do with material anything. The real poverty is how you're treated by those who are not poor in their eyes. It's actually in the looking upon a person as inferior or a failure or a bludger, which he used in his earlier <laughs> lecture. He didn't want a whole nation of bludgers, as he put it, because his idea was to get rid of social welfare. He sees that as somehow entitlement. It's not. There isn't full employment. There are people who fall through the cracks, as he put it. There's truth in that. But that's to do with imperfect markets, imperfect systems, where not everybody's going to get a job. And even if they're lined up to be forced to take a job, not every employer is going to do it. They may not want you. There's also a thing called fate in one's life. Sometimes you can try extremely hard and get nowhere. And often the carrot is hung before people to say, if you work really hard, you'll get everything you want. Well, most people do work really hard and they don't. I've worked, as I said, in previous communications in 400 companies. I just want to make another point. 400 places I've worked in. And that's not a imagined figure. That is exactly what's, what happened. I calculated it. Did that over a period of 19 years, so over a decade. I've seen a lot of people in the workplace and I've worked in a lot of places. And the majority were unhappy. That for me is a poverty because they're not in a state of joy. It means they're working against what's true for them. That's why they're unhappy. This is something Rupert doesn't know because Rupert hasn't experienced this aspect of life. But anyway, I'll let him continue. I'll try not to interrupt, but I probably will. <laughs> the reported stories of our days is the rise of a huge new global middle class. People have emerged from poverty, or I should say, have lifted themselves out of poverty, given this chance through market reforms. A world dominated by a new middle class, of course, is not what supposed radicals had in mind a century ago when they spoke of revolution. In 1848, a German journalist looked at the industrialized world and predicted its own destruction. There's a spectre haunting Europe, he wrote, the spectre of communism. Karl Marx had a newspaper man's flair for the catchy phrase, but his predictions could not have been more off target. For one thing, communism did not come via the industrialized world. Instead, the communist revolution was led by relatively underdeveloped societies, notably Russia and China. Second, far from losing their chains, workers who lived under communist rulers were treated far worse than those in the capitalist world. The environment in these countries was degraded and that most precious of human commodities, trust, was undermined. At the apogee of communism in China during the Cultural Revolution, neighbor did not trust neighbor and father was alienated from son. Whatever the social idealism of communists, the reality was very different and almost made our planet unlivable. A 
160 years after March predicted revolution, the revolution is indeed changing our world, and for the better. But the revolution we see today is very different from the one he imagined. This revolution is a consequence of 3 billion people entering the global economy. Around the world, countries that have been blighted by civil war. I just want to pause there. 3 billion people out of 6 billion entering the middle class. That's a lot of consuming, I might add. There was a piece of writing that I read that stated that if everybody lived like the United States, we'd need four planets, such as the nature of a consumerist type of society. I just want to go into the feeling around Karl Marx because he brings up, and of course this is the tension or the, the cultural wars that we're seeing that I feel are diverting a lot of energy away from the very innovative, um, you know, inspirational um, imaginings that we could actually move toward. But instead there's always this conflict constantly. In business there's warfare, in warfare, <laughs> And ultimately, it's the civilians that seem to suffer the most through these, these games without frontiers. Wars without tears is the song that comes to me. So going back to Karl Marx, it was the tyranny of the ruling elite that created the desire within the proletariat to, if you like, react to the indulgences of that minority. Karl Marx, I think, just simply gave voice to the grievances through the great hardships that ordinary Russian people go through and do today. They're an amazing people, the Russian people. I met them when I went and clowned in Russia, thanks to Rupert's sister. <laughs> Helen, <laughs> she was the one that actually paid for my trip. So I feel great love for her. So I'll just sit with that for a moment because I believe in stillness. I think our answers come from within, not necessarily from without. The newspapers just came into my mind. It's like often we're not reflecting enough. Huge pain is what I see straight away in the working classes, not heard. Still the case today, I've, I've myself have had experiences many times where I'm not heard, I'm just ignored or they're indifferent. And it comes from a sense of superiority that is really a product of generation of wealth, which we see as success. People see it as bettering yourself and certainly Rupert states that and others would definitely agree with that. But we, in that conceptual reality, better ourselves at the expense of others who do not get a voice. So whilst we might be receiving information from media and whilst there might be rhetoric, rhetoric around giving the people what they want, the reality is we're not heard. We're really not because we're not giving um, columns to us to express ourselves and that would be the, the highest honouring, if you like, of the public. But... Again, in Russia, a very difficult um, culture, country to live in, in the sense that it's cold, very, very cold. There's a uniformity, form, formity, uniformity in what people wear. There's kind of a, a bleakness, a little bit like England, the British. Um, the working classes in Britain would have felt the same as the working classes within Russia, the industrialization where they were working incredibly long hours, they were hungry, they weren't paid much, some were went down mines, uh, very poor conditions or, or perhaps died with mines collapsing. There was a lot of coal burning at that time so there was smog everywhere. I'm naturally going between the Russian and the British because I'm seeing and feeling similarities in the plight of the workers. These are the people who are not calling the shots. They're the ones that have been 
raised in a system that's telling them they have to do this work in order to make money, in order to survive. The carrot is often held in front of them to say, well, if you do everything we want, your improving of yourself is our approval of you, not your approval of you. So there's a real difference, and that's what elite mindsets tend to see is that if you don't do it their way, you're somehow a failure. For me personally, I'm not business oriented. I was never business oriented. That doesn't make me a failure. It makes it different. I was more inspired by music and art and poetry. I'm certainly interested intellectually in what's going on around the world, but I don't want to make money out of people. It's never been a motivator for me. So my poverty that I live in, the society would certainly look at me as poor. I own nothing. I don't have a home and I don't have income. So I would be the poorest of the poor in actual fact. And you would look at me and say, how is that possible? Look where you are. But technically, I am the poorest of the poor. And it's not because of any failure. It's because of my desire to follow who I am. It's so strong in me to be who I am that that material world didn't interest me. I was never motivated by the money. I was always motivated by learning. I was always motivated by exploring, by trying new things, having the courage to step out of what's comfortable, whereas most people don't feel they can, whereas I have. I've travelled the world alone. You know, I travelled Australia. Rupert talked about, you know, the rural Australians, you know, in the townships, and he admired their toughness in that that has gone on and got it done. And certainly he's coming from that generation, as is my own father, similar generation. But it was tough in those days too. I heard Rupert say that he came from a boarding school outside of Melbourne where I am now. It sounds like he had a really hard time there. And I really felt when um, I heard that, I felt for him. Maybe that framed a hardness in him, which he saw as kind of a steel in the back to sort of just plough through. And I, I tend to see that more as a masculine perspective. I mean, I have a, a steel in me as well, but it's not a steel that's ruthless to the extent of walking over people to get what I want. I'm not interested. It's more principled, actually. It comes from I just can't go against what's true for me. And that would be perceived, if you like, as a determination. But it's actually ethics for me. So in the rural context, people had to work extremely hard to make ends meet. And certainly I grew up in an era where my parents were not rich and everyone was pretty equal. Rupert talks about egalitarianism. We were, we were equal. We didn't have, you know, people that were extremely rich next to people who were extremely poor. There was none of that in this country. And that's what makes Australia so unique in the world. We're a young country and we really have come out of equality. And that's not to say there were not injustices meted out on the Indigenous. There were. There were wars here too, which were not reported in our history. But nonetheless, um, discriminations definitely occurred here. The White Australia policy is a shame to our country. But that was very much at the time reflective of sort of Anglo-Saxon perspective around the world of that rising wealth pretty much embodied within the, the white or Caucasian culture, the British, the Americans, Canadians, the Australians. We've got the New Zealanders next door. But inherently it's predominantly the US and Britain that drove that image, if you like, of the, of the successful white person. In truth, there's two-thirds of the world's population filled to the brim with brilliant people who are absolutely unable to get past that barrier given poverty. I know the structural violence of poverty. I live it every friggin' day. Sometimes I can afford to photocopy. Sometimes I can't. Sometimes I can afford to drive my car a certain distance. Other times I can't. Certainly I can't drive more than 100 kilometres with the money I have. 
I'm on 35 bucks a week. <laughs> My mother's sending it <laughs> because I've I've gone off welfare. So he may be happy about that, saying, good on you, but you're living off your mother. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure he'd whack that <laughs> out from underneath me and say, right, sink or swim. <laughs> and I, I would continue whether she sends me money or not, but she's, she's at least giving me food so I can keep working on world peace, which is what my interest is, world peace. It's not a bloody marketable commodity. The minute I go into economics on world peace, I lose the integrity of what I'm doing because then it becomes about the money, not the principle, not the value of peace, which everyone is craving for in this world. Not everybody can live in a condominium in New York or Manhattan, you know, and surround themselves with people who are all doing very well and then say, the rest of you are not trying hard enough. That's totally untrue. I've worked hard my entire life. I'm working hard now. He seems to think that just because a person's in poverty and uh, unemployed that they're all sitting around, uh, you know, with nothing to do. Well, I work every single day, seven days a week, on work that I think benefits humanity. Now, he could turn to me and say, well, that's, um, that's not the norm. The Most of them would just be sitting around going swimming. Well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with people going out and having a good time? And you might say, well, not on the expense of us. We are paying for it. If we're resenting the fact that people who are unemployed or homeless are actually having some positive experiences in their lives, what does that have to do with us? You might say, I don't want to pay for that. Would you want that? And I'll guarantee you the majority of people, because I've worked with a lot of them, thousands, would want that. The jealousy is there. Most people are not happy in their work. They're not feeling inspired because they're the head of a corporation or they're really, you know, receiving the fruits of their labours. Most people are not receiving the fruit of their labour. Most of them are the working poor where they're just working to pay bills and they hate their job. So it's not, the reality is very different on the ground is the point I want to make to Rupert with love. I know I'm sounding passionate and perhaps he may perceive this as um, all very well, but it's really coming from a genuine intention to try to paint another picture in order for him to see. And I know that he he loved this artist. What was his name? Dry, was it Drysdale? Drysdale? I had a look at some of the pictures that Rupert was referring to. And they were very beautiful images. And there were certain things that he said that I liked, you know, where he appeared to have an empathy for Indigenous peoples. And if that's a genuine statement, you know, I'm really pleased to hear that because he hasn't got good press himself around the world and he hasn't. In respect of the mainstream, many Australians are very cynical about the media. This may be a great, exciting digital new era for those in power, but for the majority, we've heard it all before, we we can see the self-seeking in the media. You know, people will attach their hats to various media articles and say this is true, and then they'll argue the toss about what someone else has written that sounds right, and then they get on board with it. But, you know, a lot of people are unhappy because of what they hear in the news. Many people feel a deep sense of sorrow at the shape of the world because there's too much media coming out that's unkind, that's demeaning of other people, that absolutely these paparazzi just went after the news of the world stuff, you know. They go after, they tap into their phones. There's no respect for the subject that they're trying to pursue. Look at poor Princess Diana in the UK. I'll never forget when she was in the gym some photographer took a picture of her legs open. How humiliating. Now, this is not integrity. This is not producing the news that's honest and straightforward. It's not. It's, it's more like 
um, sort of guttural, cheap gossip to make them buy the paper. It's not about feeding the soul of that person, which is what they're all crying out for. If you really want to know what your readers want, they want truth, real truth. They want you to come out and speak it. You know, when I was listening to Rupert, there was much I liked in what he said, but then I sat back and said, well, is it true? Is he just saying that, you know? And certainly there were certain ideological statements that he was making that I could see was probably reflective, you know, of what has shaped him. But what we really need are leaders who care about people and who know what it's like. Most of the people at that end don't know. They've never lived this life, and yet they sit and they preach to us and say, uh, you know, I'm like you. I mean, even... Scott Morrison, our current Prime Minister, they started off with ScoMo to try and make him look like he had a nickname. He didn't wear the Akubra hat, which is typically a symbol of Australia. He put on a baseball hat. I mean, we're, we're not silly. <laughs> and as Rupert Murdoch said, that there was this sort of attitude that the public are idiots. We're not. <laughs> we do see. <laughs> but we don't feel we can say or do anything about it. And that is the the barrier, whether you're talking entrenched poverty, whether you're talking a middle class, majority of people don't feel heard in any case. Majority of people can't break through those ceilings because there isn't an egalitarian mindset around it. So having said that, I'm going to continue with him and I'll listen to what he has to say. Stability and communism are taking advantage of these new opportunities. And the success of these once cursed countries is a lesson for the rest of the world and for us. Entrepreneurs and workers are creating wealth. And in the process, they are fostering something many societies have never before known. A middle class linked to the global economy abroad and expanding opportunity at home. Elitists are almost dismissive of the very words middle class because the fashionable have ersatz contempt for middle-class values and taste. Yet our country is built on an egalitarian ideal, a sense that we are all middle-class, and that to be otherwise is to be unacceptably arrogant. In my earlier discussions, I've spoken about the increased competition this new global workforce means for nations like Australia. In their own countries too, the transformation from sleepy agricultural backwaters into modern industrial economies has brought enormous challenges. The industrial revolution in China, and that is what we are all witnessing, has created a growing middle class, but also a growing environmental problem. Yet despite the many pressures on them, leaders of once poor nations can see the virtues of free markets. For example, they do not see the financial mayhem on Wall Street as a fatal flaw, but rightly a symptom of an excess that the system is purging. Far better to purge excess than to purge millions of innocent people. But I just want to stop him there to purge excess as if it's a, a free flowing situation in Wall Street. There's also arguments that these collapses are um, orchestrated market intelligence ahead of time, uh, insider trading, corruption within the financial markets, given the subprime situation in the United States, is not the result of a free functioning market. Free, free markets is like um, demand and supply operating without any regulation, if you like. We used to talk in economics of the perfect market. Everybody knows the prices. I think the Wall Street would be probably reflective of that perfect market, except when insider trading happens. Or I just want to sit with that for a second. Wheeling and dealing amongst competitors to fix prices. One could argue with the oil industry how interesting it is 
that all the petrol prices are very similar. We had the Trade Practices Act here. I'm not sure. No one talks about it anymore. But the point of that was that the suppliers of that particular product or commodity were not to collude together to fix prices. But what we see with the, the fuel here is it's all set around a similar price across a number of uh, retailers. That's a form of price fixing. Now, he's talking about purging the system. Well, people's lives, people jump out of windows as, as a result of a stock market collapse. The people who lost all their homes in the subprime, you know, disaster, which is what it was, became homeless. That's not a purging of the system. For those individual people, they are in a position where they can do nothing. The banks foreclose on them, they lose everything. We have a financial system, fractional reserve banking, where a fraction of the money that people put into the bank as a deposit, fraction is kept on reserve, the rest is lent out at an additional interest. Every transaction we make with the bank, it used to be a savings bank where you had interest accumulate. I had savings when I was young that went on for like 10, 20 years and they were accumulating. Today, if I leave money in the bank, it goes in fees. Those fees are not true. It's not like the bank has to pay in order to keep a digital account. It doesn't. It's profit making out of its customers. And we, the people at the who are the subject of decisions made on Wall Street, decisions made by the Reserve Bank here in Australia, decisions made by the banking fraternity and the very powerful banking interests. We are the ones that are purged in a sense. We are the ones that lose everything. What do you say to the partner of someone who's beloved other suicided because they couldn't cope, they lost everything. See, the mentality of structures, when you're thinking on global strategy, you're thinking, you know, new markets, you can't see the wood for the trees, you can't see the people that you're impacting. And on a scale that Rupert's working at, millions of people are being impacted by a few, and he's part of that global elite. He can't talk about a middle class as if he is one when he's never been it. Never been middle class. I am middle class. Yes, I live in poverty now, but I've been middle class most of my life. And the truth of the matter is there's not a growing middle class here in Australia. What's happening is we're getting pauperized because the commodity markets are collapsing for us as sheep, the mining industry, because of, you know, economic collapses abroad. We're finding our middle class is becoming impoverished and in fact in the homelessness area of which I'm part of, a lot of women my age are homeless, Rupert. I'm 54 this year, homeless. Not because they didn't have enough gall to get out there and get a job. It's got nothing to do with that. These are structural problems inherent within the system. These are barriers to entry. Then we have a social security system that should provide a basic safety net so people can eat at the very least when the titans at the top are creating machinations that are impoverishing thousands, if not millions, potentially billions because of the greed inherent within their strategizing and the bubble in which they live is not the real world. So coming back to homelessness, there's a lot of women, a lot of young girls on the street in Melbourne, where you're from, in Melbourne. We're talking 16 year old. How is she a failure? She's come from a family that's broken down. It's dysfunctional because the social reality has been ignored. Now I know in one of your previous talks, you talked about Human capital. Well, I take exception to the term capital. We are not human capital. 
My value is not inherent on the basis of what you pay me. My value is equal to every person. This is the egalitarianism of your own culture. I am equal to everyone, no matter what money I make, no matter how articulate I might sound. Even if the next person to me is talking like a street person who's got no education, they are equal to me. Our middle class is sliding down. They're becoming poor, working poor in your own country. This is what's happening. Now, you can say we need to join the digital reality of the entire world. That isn't going to stop the egress. It's not going to stop the decline here because we're all competing worldwide. We're not working together as one global society, and I know you have a digital vision of that. But that's more in, the, in a top-down type control structure. It isn't about a true global society evolving itself, not to make more markets, but to become better human beings. The social side is completely neglected and then they're victim blamed because the structure doesn't work. The economic structure does not work work. I'm an economist. I can see this. The externalities are getting worse. Pollution, military machinations where they're experimenting with climate, nuclear explosions even in our country, Australia, in Woomera. It was lots of nuclear testing. Now the big issue we're confronting right now, and that is very much landed in the heart of the digital reality, is radiation. People will be looking around going, why are people getting cancer? We never had cancer in this country when I was a kid. Never heard of it. Why is it my friends got cancer? I got cancer last year. At least one in two are getting cancer. I'm doing research on the RF radio frequency radiation World Health Organization scientists are talking about the probable causes of cancer as a result. The mobile towers are being rejected in various states in the United States, which I'm sure you're well aware of. Councils are coming out and they're actually moving those mobile towers. There's also more discussion around the iPhones and brain cancer. When the phone is sitting up around the head, some women are getting breast cancer because they're putting their phones in their bras in their pockets. We are radiating our civilization. That's why cancer, these are the health impacts. It's all very well to have these revolutionary visions to see potential digital markets that are infinite. Anyone can get off on that if they're not grounded. The various people within the Silicon Valley family their life is all online. They know nothing of walking out in the woods, in the, in the forest. They know nothing of working with the working class. They have, they have no idea of the conversations around, you know, a bar, you know, in some town. They have no idea because their world is the cyber world. Their world is one of algorithms. Their world is one of how do we cost that? How do we get, how do we price that? How do we get ads in front of people? How do we personalize it? How do we create that bond? You talked about the bond with the newspaper. I don't want to have a bond with the newspaper. What I want is human contact. I'm interested in the journalist, but what I'm particularly interested in is one with integrity. And I've met quite a few have, who had complete elitists themselves. And these were people I thought were grounded. <laughs> I was really amazed. They sound so terrific when they give lectures. You go up and talk to them and they dismiss you because you're middle class. You're not one of them. And that's what we have created is this separation. You, you talked about communism. These are just different ways of living. At least what I can say about communism from a positive perspective is when I flew into Moscow, I saw forests. I was very happy 
because it hadn't commercialised at that point. I mean, they were starting to bring in, you know, the main Coca-Cola brands and, you know, I saw McDonald's in Mo Moscow. This was after Perestroika, you know, uh, Gorbachev. And I saw the forest from the sky and I was, I was breathing relief because I know we're deforesting our planet. We've got no connection to the natural systems anymore. We've completely lost it. And those at the top of the so-called food chain are the most disconnected of all. We've lost the feeling for the people. When you call a person human capital, you have no concept of that human being, which is why I do this video for you. I'm a human. I'm not capital. I have passions. I have feelings. I'll try not to cry because I'm not impressed with the way I've been treated. It's, it's appalling. And all I've tried to do is retain integrity. That's, all, that's what I've actually tried to do. All my writings, everything's about integrity. It's about having a voice where I've had none. It's about knowing my own self-worth and acting on it. So I'm just communicating this to you out of love, believe it or not, because I don't think you get it. But I am going to listen to you because I respect all people equally. So I'll continue with listening to your story. The former UN Secretary General, Kurt Viannan, and I probably do not agree with on many things. But he put it very well when he described the entry of these nations into the global economy this way. The main losers in today's very unequal world, he said, are not those who are too much opposed to globalization. They are those who have been left out. If Mr. Annan is right, one of the greatest services we in rich countries can do for the poor is to open markets for their goods. And in this, Australians can take some pride in our national record, at least in recent decades. Through our leadership in the Cairns Group, a group of nations committed to liberalising trade in agriculture, Australia has helped open global markets to the things that poor countries actually produce. And I reckon that we probably do more for poor people around the world by opening up agricultural markets than we do with all our foreign aid combined. In some senses, globalization is not new. A century ago, for example, the international economy was more linked and it was in many ways easier to trade and travel. But in our day, the reach of globalization has been greater. Its effects are more extensive and we are far from its final phase. The era of great globalization began after the Second World War. I'm just going to stop it there before he goes into explaining globalization when he goes through the trading systems. I had an image of traveling the world, which I did in 2010 by myself, 20 countries. I did it because I've, I, I, may, I laugh because <laughs> I call myself a world peace clown. I felt I should travel the world. <laughs> and I had no money at the time, but the money came. I managed to get one job, which actually bought my ticket. But what I want to talk about globalization because that's what I noticed, um, particularly in South America, Central America and South America. What I saw was these big multinationals coming in, people who were traditional artisans having to find themselves in factories. This is not the story that, that Rupert's going to be expressing because it's not one he's familiar with. I remember, and I feel sad when I remember this lady, she was a traditional Indian. I was in Cusco, um, which is in Argentina. I was actually going to Machu Picchu. And she was in the phone box, sitting there in the phone box. And I came to her with a, oh, I was actually in Peru, sorry, Peruvian, not Argentina, Peru. I was with a Peruvian guy and I got him to translate to her. She was falling through the cracks of this 
impending capitalism coming into the, well, not impending, it was their capitalism in her country and her loss of her traditional life. And she was stuck, didn't know how to make money, had no concept of making money. And I might just add, there was a comment by Rupert around Indigenous, it takes time for people to become socialised into the way we think. They don't think like we think. They have a much more beautiful mind and they're very innocent. They're very generous was what I noticed. So anyway, I went to this phone box with this lady and this guy and he translated for me and I held her hand. I told how beautiful she is and I said that she is loved and I'm very happy to give her some of my clothes that I had back at the place I was staying. I didn't have much money, so I could, I could give her a little bit, but not much. I asked her to, through this guy if she would like to come back to the place I was staying um, and I can then give her some things. She didn't end up coming, unfortunately. But what I saw was the difference. I saw her her displacement within her own country. And that's what happens when corporations come in, they're large, they take up the population in employment, which takes them out of their traditional villages. It pulls them away from their families. They change culture because of the business acumen that comes in. And this is not understood by capitalists who go in. For me, I didn't like the uniformity of globalisation where you see McDonald's everywhere or, you know, a lot of the brand images, Pizza Hut, you know, the American ones that are in Australia that we think are Australian and they're not. <laughs> we don't even know. I reckon if we did a poll, a lot of Australians would think these companies were ours, but they're not. They're global brand images. I spoke, I've spoken with people on my travels and, you know, they didn't find the working conditions very good. So exploitation was what happened in many of these poorer countries that he say he says are have improved. When I was in Chile, there were slum areas that I came across, high levels of unemployment, which can only exist in you know conceptual realities of employment. When everybody's living close to the same, like even in the Second World War, people were all suffering together, there wasn't that sense of collective poverty because what creates the poverty is the differences we create between each other when, when I call you poor or I call you rich. When I look at Rupert like he's some, you know, some godlike character because of what is perceptually perceived of what he's achieved, I, I then create a distance between us and I don't want that. I see him as an equal. He could be like my father, my family. I'm not in admiration of whether you accumulate a lot of resources or assets because I can see the planet um, really going through great pain. The planet's been exploited to the max by this Protestant work ethic that can't stop that has to go further and further and further. And even the whole digital thing is just another extension of the same mindset that wants more and more and more, that is so greedy, that's not satisfied on any level with itself, its situation, it wants more. And as it takes more, others get less. That is how poverty creates. The people are not creating it, it's the Ones who are creating the wealth who don't get it, who do feel entitled because they create networks around them. They get access politically. They install leaders. As Rupert perfectly knows, that democratic process is totally undermined. Is that fair? Is that respect? Is that integrity? You can't know that unless you live like us and you don't live like us and that's why you don't know us. <laughs> that's why I'm talking to you. So I'll continue on. Have a listen. In the, 
Pacific, the Allied victory led to the emergence of a free and democratic Japan. This was followed by the rise of Asia's tiger economies and the success of... I have to pause him about Japan because I just was listening to Helen Caldicott today who was talking about the Fukushima uh, three meltdowns apparently and it's never going to stop, she said. The um, conclusion of what happened in Japan needs to be understood as well. The Japanese did actually surrender before those atomic bombs were dropped, hence radiation, another issue. They refused to give up Hirohito, which was the unconditional surrender that was demanded of them by the United States. They wanted to surrender but not give up their leader and they insisted that they had to give him up. So they couldn't agree to it, and that's when those bombs got dropped. We've used violence to settle disputes. It doesn't settle disputes. It stays in the collective memory of the people. And I know certainly the Japanese um, built in a, a peace declaration into their constitution, it became a peace constitution. It was the first in the world, in actual fact because they suffered greatly and they're suffering today. They're suffering cancer because of what's gone on in Fukushima. That nuclear plant should never have been built. And they call that clean energy. It's not. There was a bit of a push here in Australia recently too, some years ago, about clean energy and it was, it was just so untrue. And, and this is where we all get cynical when we listen to leaders. You know, there's, it's half truths, it's partial truths, it's selective attention. They don't have the full picture. They rely on things historical, but from certain perspectives, not the whole. We just we just can't get our head around the whole truth of matters, but we speak as if we know it. There were many histories, not just his story. She has a story too, but that's never heard, <laughs> you know. So <laughs> I just smile. I'm, I'm just putting really another perspective just for the sake of contrast, okay. So I will continue on with Rupert. Now inspiring leaders from Belgrade to Bogota to do the same for their people. The tiger economies were Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea and Taiwan. And their dramatic success should teach us that we should never write off a country as hopeless. None of these societies had any natural resources to speak of. Two were British colonies. The other two were part of split nations they were more or less at war with their neighbours for decades. They also endured decades of autocratic rule. The Tigers had different governments and very different histories, but they all had one important thing in common. They relied on exports and they wanted to compete with the best companies and countries in the world. That meant that their businesses had to be internationally competitive and we can see the results. Japan transformed itself from a cruel imperial power to a democratic trading nation that became a model for others. Singapore faced... I just want to start there again with Japan as a cruel imperial power. Well, that was just within the context of the Second World War. I'm just thinking of the um, samurai. Well, the samurai, they had a culture. They were a warlike culture. They were warriors, actually. But there's also Zen Buddhism, Buddhism alongside that. See, it's not all just one perspective. Zen Buddhism was a very peaceful perspective. And if you talk with Japanese or connect with Japanese people, they're very respectful. They have a very strong social ordering. They're very group-oriented. I know that there's high suicide rates in Japan too because of that structure and honour Humiliation is really hard for them to bear, the men particularly. But the women, I guess, were holding the place together through their love of their children. They didn't have many children either in Japan. It's a very small country. Well, it's an archipelago, in actual fact. Islands. The cruel imperialism, someone could argue that the British were that, certainly in India, and they suppressed the Indians uh, before the war 
Um, some of the, I remember Gandhi talking about um, in the Gandhi movie actually by um, Attenborough, Richard Attenborough produced that film. There was scenes, I don't know if there were scenes in there, but maybe I've read it, where the Indians had to crawl on all fours when a British person approached. They were definitely second class. Um, they were very controlled in respect of British trade. Britain used their resources, tea trade, salt, and various other, you know, industri industries because it was a colony. So that was a, a country um, very much suppressed by an imperial rule. That was cruel. You know, these things we say at the top, off the top of our heads, we don't stop and pause and reflect, were we that? Well, the Indigenous here in Australia would say, yes, you were that to us. Yeah, we're, you know, a lot of Indigenous women had to work as, you know, servants, so they were slaves virtually. There was, they were, you know, some of the Indigenous were picked off because they were seen as impacting or affecting the farmers' um, sheep or, or whatever they were growing. They were taking, you know, maybe sheep here and there and, and thus the farmers saw them as vermin. They were poisoned in Tasmania, all of them. It was genocide in Tasmania. So have we not been a sort of an imperial power that was cruel? See, it's to take the, 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 lot, the speck, you know, we, we see the log in the other's eye, but we don't see the speck in our own. And that's when history is, is written from the perspective of the victors. And anything negative that was done by us is watered down and anything terrible that was done by the other is really amplified. We have a lot of soul searching to do. No one is holier than, that, than thou. And really the truth is the only thing that really matters because we can only learn from it when we're, when we're prepared to accept responsibility for what we actually do to people. And what I see is a lack of responsibility is the key theme across the world. No one will take responsibility. They have lawyers lined up and they will lie on your behalf. The so-called rule of law becomes perverted if you are a lower class or of lower status. I've experienced this. You can't access lawyers if you can't afford them. This is the structural violence, form of imperialism, still exists today in pockets. I can't just walk into the top CEO of a company and start a conversation because that person will say, well, who are you? What do you want? Has this got anything to do with business? No. Well, what are you doing here? I wouldn't even get in the door because there's a ceiling. But if I came to that person as a marketing manager for another company and I was offering something that they want to hear, doors open. So then we create a world of I'm only going to relate to you if you're speaking my language if you're giving me what I want. It's not about we, it's about you. And that's the selfishness that's created, that's unconscious bias that exists. So I'm just saying that's what I hear when I, I, I hear history being spoken from a perspective. I'm sure the Japanese have a different view. Communist interaction was kicked out of the Malaysian Federation and later abandoned by Britain. He had built a wealthy society that is known throughout the world as the Switzerland of Asia. Hong Kong absorbed more than a million refugees from China in the 1950s and maintained one of the world's freest economies. As a result, these refugees were given the chance to use their resourcefulness. And this former British colony surpassed Mother England in terms of per capita GDP. South Korea went from dictatorship to democracy, transforming a war-torn country into a world trading power. 
Like South Korea, Taiwan transformed itself from a poor nation living under one-party rule into a world trading power and the world's first Chinese democracy. In more recent years, the success of Japan and the Four Tigers has been emulated by a new group of Asian nations, Malaysia, Indonesia and Thailand. In the 1990s, the World Bank described the success of these nations in a study called the East Asian Miracle. Here is how the World Bank described their economic takeoff. Between 1960 and 1985, Real income per capita increased more than four times in Japan and the Four Tigers and more than doubled in Indonesia, Malaysia and Thailand. If growth were randomly distributed, there is roughly one chance in 10,000 the success would have been so regionally concentrated. There were many factors that helped these countries turn themselves around. But the main ingredient was their openness to international markets and international competition and their success helped pave the way for the most revolutionary development of the 20th century, China's decision to enter the global economy. In late 1978, Deng Xiaoping faced a China devastated by the Cultural Revolution and years of Mao's misrule. He made a courageous decision. He was going to embrace the market and end China's isolation from the world and he did. It did not come all at once. It suffered some terrible setbacks, notably Tiananmen Square. And it is a revolution that remains far from complete, but it is also real. Back in the 1970s, the left wing was fond of the analogy of a spaceship Earth to describe the global economy. In this model, the space capsule had five astronauts, each astronaut represented about a billion people, which added up together equaled the world's population. One of these astronauts consumed most of the resources in the space capsule. This astronaut represented the developed world, which is said to be consuming more than its fair share of the world's resources. What those who invoked the spaceship Earth model never pointed out was that the same astronaut produced more than 85% of those resources. The rest were producing almost nothing. If these astronauts would become as productive as the other, the world would grow fantastically richer and everyone would be better off. And that's exactly... See, again, he goes back to richer and better off. I certainly accept um, improving standards of living. I accept that. Because I did see footage when I was in Thailand of the poverty that people were in. And then I've, I've lived in Bangkok as well. But that was like over polluted, too many cars, too much materialism, a lot of social problems, see. He says they're better off. Are we better off? If there's one in four having mental health issues, if we're disconnecting emotionally from each other in impersonal megacities, are we better off? If our families are all splitting up because they're all going off in different directions and not speaking to each other for one reason or another because we haven't learned how to resolve conflict, we haven't learned how to be a fully functional family where we have fought one another rather than respected one another, are we better off because we have more money? See, again, that mindset of it's all about the money, the whole world, if it all, if it all generates what the United States, well, the, gener the generation of those products have come from the resources of other countries. Certainly in the case of Britain, it's come from the colonies. That's where they got the resources. That's why they had the colonies. If they had nothing there, they wouldn't have been colonies. United States, it's global corporations develop their componentry right around the globe. It's not being all produced in the United States. They go to the, the lowest cost countries. They get the cheapest labor. So those poor people in Thailand, Malaysia and so forth would have been the ones in the factories 
of the multinationals earning a dollar a day or two dollars a day so Nike shoes sell for what two hundred dollars when they only cost two bucks to make maybe three bucks maybe less exploitation occurs because they want the profit margin are those people better off I walked through a target factory in Thailand and from my perspective they thought I was uh, an employee of Target but I was actually with a peace rotary peace group and what I saw was lines and lines of women with men at the end of each line they had a clock which was where the quota was being flashed so they had a certain quota of clothes to make so they're under pressure you can't go to the toilet <laughs> You know, I'm sure they do go to the toilet, but I tell you what, the pressure to work was, was on and they were paid nothing. And I felt compassion for them when I walked through that factory. It's like a bunch of factory hens, mate. Is that, is that better for them than living in their village? See, these are really, really important questions that have to be reflected on rather than seeing a different viewpoint as someone you want to attack or destroy or dissent is somehow disloyal it's not about that different viewpoints are different perspectives from different life experiences and that should be honored as part of diversity but when i see adversarial stances being made them and us left and right up and down i personally don't care about any of that I can only offer what I know out of my own experience. So why are those women better off in a factory in Thailand than their village? We'd have to ask them what they feel. Are they happy? That's not to say everyone's unhappy. Some may be very happy. I don't know. All I can say is what a life, long hours, low pay. Is that fair? I mean, in Australia, we have Advanced Australia Fair. Are we being fair? Are these developed countries being fair to those who are least developed? They say, oh, we're, we're giving them jobs. Well, what sort of jobs are you giving them? Again, I experience structural violence here in Australia. This is a Johan Gultung, if you want to look up Transcend. Uh, Johan Gultung's um, from Norway. He was the one who coined structural violence um, as violence inherent within the system uses pay in australia for example if i'm on a low income there's many things i can't access i become excluded from that society because i don't have the money to pay i can't go on a toll road you know i can't pay parking i can't go to a restaurant i can't go to a theater I have no money. Thankfully for me, because I'm very passionate about what I'm doing, I don't feel a loss, but I'm sure others do. So that concept of are we all better off? Yes, in a material sense, when people's material life to some degree have got shelter, food, water, which is all anybody ever needs, to have that does feel to some degree secure but then on the other hand to lose one's freedom to lose one's life in service of another in a way that you feel you have no choice is that the freedom that this system is bringing prosperity and freedom is what's touted here is that true prosperity for whom well the owners of those businesses are making extraordinary profits when you're paying someone two dollars a day or 20 bucks an hour and you're making thousands and thousands tens of thousands a week how is that egalitarian will you say well we're the ones that took the risk well not necessarily if you've come from a rich family you could raise the capital it's not hard to buy in the people you need in order to get that business going you've had entitlement but when you come from a lower class and you've got no money you can't pay for the accountant to help you set up the business you can't access a university if there's costs involved in order to get the qualifications you need to do it 
you know, the, the barriers are huge. You can't take out a loan if you've got no assets. This is how people get stuck. Rupert doesn't know this because he's had a privileged life. He's grown up in a, he was in a boarding school. You know, this is a private school education. He thinks the whole public school system's rubbish. Well, it's not. I grew up in the public school system. And the reason my English actually wasn't that good on leaving school was not because I wasn't taught well. It was because I had dyslexia. I couldn't read well. And I didn't have a family that encouraged me to read. You know, I wasn't being read to. So I found what I liked about the public school system here in Australia was the egalitarianism. I think school for most people is boring on the whole. I ended up becoming um, a teacher of peace, which some will call left wing. It's not left wing. It's a human innate uh, quality of feeling peace within yourself, which everybody is seeking. It's got nothing to do with left or right or anything. The values I was teaching was really what joins us. It's not an ideology. So when I feel empathy for you, we join. When I feel love for you, we join. When I feel respect for you, we join. When you feel it back, that's where the joining is. When I say you're less than me, we separate. When I say you're my enemy, we separate. When I say um, I'm better than you, smarter than you, prettier than you, we separate. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm only interested in where we unite. So when I was teaching peace in the classroom, I made it fun. I was dressed as a clown. I got the kids laughing. We told jokes. They were my friends. I saw them as equal. This is true equality. I can't be a teacher above and beyond those children. Those children were sharing wisdom with me, their wisdom. They had insights that blew my mind. These were not programmed into them. They were liberated out of them because they felt happy in the classroom with me. The program I wrote was called Real Hope, and I think it could have done incredible good for a lot of children had my program been supported. But because of the structural impediments that I've experienced, I didn't get the support I needed from the schools, even though the program was successful. I was really helping children to understand discrimination and what it feels like to be excluded when we look upon another as less than us. And even when the historical record is being discussed by Rupert there, there's judgments being made about good and bad. What does he know unless he sits with those people? What does he know for sure? In the work I've done, I really tried to work on the emotional intelligence of people as more important than the intellectual knowledge, more important than gathering wealth, which is only denuding the natural resource systems in the planet. What I tried to do was to value every single child as equal and wonderful and unique. For them to come out of that class excited and happy, inspired, looking at themselves in another light, learning how to resolve conflict rather than bully others. See, there's lots of perspectives in this world and we don't talk. There's too many barriers to this openness that needs to happen. If we're to seriously bring our world together into a real evolution, we have to drop the arrogance and drop these ideas that I know better or you're the enemy. This is all not true. We are one world and if we don't get our act together in any serious way, we won't be having a future. This vision of the digital reality is not real. It really isn't. But they're going hell for leather at it, believing there's billions and billions. And yes, in the short term, they'll make money. In the long term, it all falls apart. People can't do it. They have to be free. Your prosperity and freedom has to be a real offering here, which it's not. It's, it's for those who are going to make the most out of it. You know, small government is not about less intrusion in people's lives. It's actually privatising the public assets. That's what I've realised. How is that better for us? It's not. 
So I'll, I'll listen on a little bit further and then I will stop because I know that this video is, is getting long. What has been happening? China, for example, is one of these astronauts. And by every measure, diet, education, life expectancy, Chinese today are better off than their parents or grandparents. That's because after decades of punishing wealth and suppressing human capital, the Chinese have been liberated. In a recent book called The Elephant and the Dragon, Robin Meredith focused on the rise of China. One example struck me as a good metaphor for what is happening, and it involves the Dutch multinational Philips. Ms. Meredith points out that Philips moved many of its lighting factories to China to cut costs. That means lower prices for Western consumers and better profit margins for the company. But Philips' presence in China is also playing a big part in China's own development. The more housing that is built, the more lights the Chinese people need. The same is happening with infrastructure. For example, when the Chinese government decided to modernize its highways, it needed street lights. For Philips, that meant $195 million in street lights in 2005 alone. Not everyone, of course, is sharing in this wealth. One of my nephews just returned from two years in China, where he taught English to poor kids in rural farm areas. Many people, he told me, might see meat only at Chinese New Year or some other holiday. But as the economy grows and reaches these areas, these people will begin spending it on fish and meat and other sources of protein. This is already affecting the prices of our own supermarket shelves. Fish and meat. Um, nice to hear about the nephew teaching people. That's really lovely. And getting that information back to Rupert so he can learn from that. But that's this, the peasants um, in the rural part of China, and of course China is not all one culture, it's many cultures in actual fact, like India is. So the people still very impoverished when they're outside of those economic zones. But that poverty grows with the greed that grows within the city and the self-centeredness and the, you know, this is not disparaging towards the Chinese, this is anywhere where capitalism takes root. It's a system that we humans participate in regardless of our culture and truth. It's the system we need to look at. What does it do to us? It creates the rural poor, the urban wealthy, but then within that urban structure of these huge cities, there are poor people, of course, people who are who are not, because not the systems have never been created in a way that everyone benefits equally. It's always competition, and if you're really aggressive and ruthless, you will possibly push through and make a lot of money. But for those of us who are gentle and kind and sensitive, we don't want to push like that because our innate talent is in that sensitivity. We're very human related. We don't see human capital. We see human beings. So it's a different perspective. He's sort of seeing everyone getting wealthy here. And this is one billion, more than a billion people in China. It's huge. There's not enough resources to have everybody on this planet living the same way as the United States, which is what China is clearly emulating. It's not possible. Those systems collapse. We are taking ancient fossils like the oil, for example. That's this liquefied oil that's in massive volumes under the the layers in the earth, they have to drill down in order to access this ancient oil, which was the original, you know, foliage that's broken down over millions and millions of years. It then gets pumped out and it's transformed into gas, into gases. That comes out your tailpipe. That goes into the atmosphere. That changes the composition of chemicals on the planet. We also have issues of the axis. Does that shift as a result of that weight displacement? Why did nature create that 
oil in the first place? Was it a stabiliser? You know, we because we operate in such disparate ways as discrete variables, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. We go on a track saying this is the right way, this is the only way, it's benefit, it's benefit, it's benefit, but it's not. People are not happy. The people plug themselves in. I was noticing this today. They're actually escaping the world because they find it too harsh. They're not happy. So they try and plug in music or talk to someone on the phone because they're filling gaps within themselves and that's not understood. People are unhappy. They've lost those connections to family. Community is disappearing rapidly because everybody's busy. People don't have time for each other. People work late. They don't see their neighbours. They don't even know their neighbours. So the very thing that makes us the happiest, which is each other, we've lost connection to. Now, what Rupert's describing here is this material um, expansionism that he says is the panacea for all our problems. It's not. It's the creator of them. It really is. And I feel, I feel, you know, very sad for the people who are very innocent in all of this. You know, when I was up in the, in the Himalayas, up in Nepal, I went to tribes that were not accessible by tourists. And I went with Rotary and I was teaching cultures of peace there, just giving the teachers an idea of ways of teaching peace. And I dressed as a clown and actually moved through this village and met with the children and some of the elders. And there were some old guys. It was really nice. These old guys were sitting on a bench. They sit there all day. Now, a capitalist would go, get a job. You're wasting time. <laughs> this was their culture. These guys, apparently, they fought with the Indian army, apparently. Um, of course, they're very famous in Nepalese, aren't they? But these old guys, they were just sitting there watching the donkeys go past, watching the trekkers go past <laughs> with their supplies on donkeys or on the backs of, you know, um, what are they called, Gur Gurkhas? Well, I can't remember what they... There is a name, but the Gurkhas were the ones that were in the war. Um, but they're on the backs of these beautiful Nepalese guys. They're very little guys, but they carry huge loads. They climb up these um, hills, mountains, I should say, like goats. <laughs> you know, up they go. For me, it was really exhausting because <laughs> I'm not used to climbing. So going back to that village idea, a lot of the women were helping. I remember seeing them pouring concrete. Like the pouring of concrete is not with a machine. They actually have buckets they hand to each other. And then some guy was smoothing the concrete over. The women were working in the fields, hard work. There was still a caste system, which is prevalent in India too, but it's, it's, it's disappearing. And that is probably a positive thing in respect of capitalism let's say, because people now are identifying differently. So it was, there was a debate, you know, in respect of do we teach them English because one of the Rotarians was there to create English programs, you know, so they're teaching, you know, curriculum. And it was very successful what he was doing, actually. But what, what does that open them to? Opens them to our mindset, they lose their own, you know, but then how do they survive in a globalised village? And I'm sure Rupert would be saying, well, they have to keep up with it. But they lose something very, very valuable as well. And that's not recorded as real wealth. We just go progress, progress, progress in our image. But what about all the other cultures in their own image? What makes them happy? Do we want gross domestic product or do we want gross national happiness? Bhutan's just to the top of Nepal. Do we want to be happy? All of us. This is not an us and them. This is about all of us. Are we happy? When I look at Rupert's face, I saw some photos. He didn't look happy. So all the money in the world you can have, but are you truly joyful? Are you truly at peace within yourself? Do you feel really fulfilled? And when you look out at the world, do you feel love for everyone? 
that's really, to me, the testimony of whether you've, you've been successful or not. See, it all depends on how you want to frame it. It's not about how many buildings you own or newspapers you have or media outlets or contacts or feature features where you're being presented as person of the year, whatever. Does any of that matter if you're not happy? Can you love yourself if you lost all of it and became the great failure that you so feared? Can you love yourself even if you lose all these trappings and their trappings? I sort of see it like barnacles coming off you as you truly feel the liberation of freedom, freedom from fear, freedom from expectation, freedom from standards to just simply be who you are and allow life to unfold the next step without control. That's what I feel my message is in this video as I've tried to convey another perspective. So this video is sent with great love and peace for Rupert Murdoch, a fellow Australian who my wish for is a real and lasting peace within him as the highest success. When he is at peace, I do believe incredible things will happen in this world. So that's my wish. Lots of love. Bye.